I like to talk about flow separation, what it is, uh, what fluid dynamicists do to try to predict it, to quantify it, um, and how to avoid it overall. So let's take a look. Flow separation is relatively simple to understand. Flow separation is when you have a curved surface and you would like the flow to follow this curved surface. But in practice, when you look at what is happening, what you get is a very strange boundary layer velocity distribution that you have uh, represented here. Uh, and you understand what happens once you draw the streamlines uh, along this curved surface. Um, and what happens is that the fluid does its own thing. You would like it to follow the curve, but it takes off entirely and the boundary layer just disintegrates. So separation is when your boundary layer just disintegrates, the streamlines do not follow the curve of the body you would like them to follow, and you generally fail to control, uh, to orientate the velocity of the fluid. And so it's definitely something fluid dynamicists spend a lot of time trying to predict, try to quantify, and trying to avoid in general. Um, so how do we predict this? How do we, how do we uh, quantify this mathematically or with computers? Well, the key idea is to figure out that flow separation happens when you have a completely vertical velocity profile at the wall. Uh, when this happens, uh, you have shear on the wall, which is equal to zero. And so if you have a flow, fluid flow simulation, a CFD simulation, um, then what you to identify the areas where the flow will separate, you want the software to calculate and to display for you the areas where the shear on the wall will be zero. Yes. So the equation that we try to solve in general is where in space do we have the partial derivative of velocity, stream streamwise velocity, with respect to distance away from the wall um, at uh, the surface of the wall. Where is this equal to zero? Because when you have the answer to this, you can see where flow separation occurs. So let's try to predict this mathematically. Um, if you write the Navier-Stokes equations at the wall um, inside the boundary layer, you will get uh, this equation here. And this, the first equation here um, tells you basically that acceleration, mass times acceleration, is equal to the effect of pressure and the effect of viscosity. If you apply this equation here at the wall, at the surface of the wall, then you get this. You get viscosity times the second derivative of velocity with respect to space, or distance away from the wall, at y is equal to zero. Is This is equal to the pressure gradient. This is equal to the longitudinal change of pressure. Yeah, Partial p, partial x in this distance. So when the pressure gradient when partial p partial x or dp dx when this is positive uh, then this term here at the wall is also positive it's also a positive number now let's take a look at what happens inside the boundary layer inside the boundary layer we plot u as a function of distance away from the wall y if you take the derivative of u with respect to y the first derivative partial u, partial y, you get basically the slope of this of this curve. And this slope here is something at the wall. We may not know what it is. Uh, it is definitely zero very far away here. But if you look at this area here, uh, partial u, partial y has a special sign because u um, here is larger than it is there. So as you increase distance away from the wall, u tends to increase as well. Partial u, partial y is positive. Okay, so much for partial u, partial y. Let's take a look at the second derivative of velocity with respect to space. Partial square of u with respect to partial y squared. This has different signs along the boundary layer. When you look at the top area of the boundary layer, the second derivative of velocity with respect to space, it is negative. Why? Because it is a change in space of the derivative. And this derivative is large below, and it's becoming progressively smaller and smaller. So that the second derivative of velocity with respect to space is always negative towards the top of the boundary layer. Okay, so now let's take a look. Uh, if we have a zone close to the wall where we say that 
the second derivative with respect to space of the velocity is positive, then it is positive somewhere, it needs to be zero somewhere, and then it becomes negative. So we force uh, the second derivative of velocity with respect to space to have zero value somewhere in the middle of the boundary layer. And this is what we're looking for. Second derivative of velocity with respect to space is always negative at the top of the boundary layer. And when you have pressure increasing with respect to distance, it is positive at the bottom of the boundary layer, negative and positive. So it changes the sign in between. When it changes sign, what happens is that you have an inflection point. It's this point at which the second derivative of space of velocity with respect to space uh, is equal to zero. It's called the inflection point of the boundary layer. This is the point at which the curve changes. It goes from this direction to that direction over there. Above the inflection point, the net shear is decelerating. The derivative is negative. Um, and it means that if you put a particle inside the flow here, it will be slowed down progressively as it goes down. But um, below the inflection point, it is the opposite. If you put a particle here, it will be accelerated through the flow. And so what you do uh, get, it, as soon as you have an inflection point, is that the particles below the inflection point are accelerated, while the particles above the inflection point are decelerated. And what you get is a boundary layer that is going to crumple over, its, over itself. It's like you have sheets of paper that you rub one against the other and hope that they stay in, in nice sheets, uh, but in practice they will crumple uh, over one another. And this is exactly what happens inside the boundary layer. So as soon as you have inflection points, your boundary layer is likely to separate. This is the main idea. Um, two crucial points to remember. Separation occurs if a positive pressure gradient exists. So if you have a body um, and you're looking to predict where the flow will separate as it passes over the body, then you should look at the areas around this body where the pressure stream-wise is going to increase. The areas where the pressure will decrease, mathematically it's impossible that the flow separates here. Uh, the areas at risk of separation are the, are the areas where the pressure tends to increase. And typically, this happens behind objects. So let me give you a practical example for this. Uh, let's say you are um, looking at cyclists passing around. Uh, there are lots of cyclists in, uh, in our town, in Magdeburg. And you sit by the river and you look at all the people wearing helmets and passing around. Well, how do you recognize a complete loser who does not understand how fluid mechanics work? Well, they're using a helmet that is smooth at the front, which is quite nice. But then at the area here, where pressure goes from low value to high value at the back here, you have a sharp turn. Now this sharp turn here is definitely the area where you're gonna have flow separation. Flow separation will mean that the pressure here will be even lower, and then you drag along as you cycle on your bicycle. You drag along a low pressure area behind your head. What fluid dynamicists would definitely wear instead of this awful helmet is a helmet that would look like this. Now this is, now we're talking about something serious. With a helmet that looks like this, it has nothing to do with looking cool. It's just all about the flow separation. What you have is a low pressure area here. And then instead of a, instead of a sharp turn where you have pressure that tends to increase uh, at the bottom, uh, what you have is a very smooth, progressive tail here that prevents flow separation over there. When you have a, a big nose and it sticks out, you also get an extra aerodynamic advantage, but you have to take advanced fluid dynamics to figure out what it is. Yes? So definitely, whenever you have a body and you, have, you are at risk of having flow separation on this body, then make the transition from low pressure to high pressure, make this transition as smooth as possible, and this will prevent the boundary layer from separating and you from getting a low pressure area at the back of your object. Okay, the second thing that you need to, to see and to learn about fluid mechanics, uh, the fluid mechanics of a boundary layer, is that laminar boundary layers, they separate a lot more easily. 
And this is bad because we love laminar boundary layers because they are very smooth, they're easy to predict, um, and they have low friction. Uh, but what you want, if you want to prevent separation or delay it at least, is to make the boundary layer turbulent. Yeah? So let me give you an example. If you fly one of those airplanes, these are very slow airplanes with very thick wings. What you try to do is to generate um, a, a sharp turn of the air on top of the wing. It's a very thick wing, a very sharp turn. And to negotiate this sharp turn, to make sure the boundary layer does not separate, what you're going to put on top of the wing, on the, on the surface of the wing, is what we call turbulators, which are little pieces of metal that you bolt on top of the wing. And those will force the boundary layer to transit from something laminar to something turbulent. And as, as the boundary layer becomes turbulent, it generates more drag, which is a disadvantage, but it's less likely to separate, which is what you want in slow maneuvering flight, uh, like so. So if you look at the top of the wing, this is now, you're looking downstream. Um, so this is the front of the wing and the back of the wing is over there. Uh, the turbulences look like this. You try to generate turbulence inside the boundary layer in the very close uh, few centimeters away from the wing. Let's look at another example. This is uh, one of the many trains in the Shinkansen family, the uh, family of high-speed Japanese trains. Um, and they look uh, fast, not just are fast. Uh, they look the part. This is, um, I, I forgot the exact name of this train here. Uh, but if you look at, at those trains, what you want to have on those trains is a very smooth laminar boundary layer. And so for this, you have very pointy uh, trains and you have very smooth surface that you would try to keep clean. But if you look now at the power transmission uh, elements, so the, the element, the pylon that goes from the train carriage up to the cable uh, where you have electricity flowing, um, this pylon here has on the side here, these turbulators, and they are to make sure that the air as it transits, um, as it builds up a, a boundary layer here, this boundary layer transits into turbulent boundary layer and then sticks and attaches at the back of the pylon so that you decrease drag uh, by avoiding separation around this pylon. Separation and also noise associated with separation, very important noise in uh, Japanese high-speed trains. Another example, uh, this is uh, the latest Boeing uh, that was built, the Boeing 787, a very efficient airplane. Again, you want a very smooth skin to have a boundary layer that is as small and as smooth as possible. Um, but if you look at the tail of this airplane, on the surface of the tail, if you zoom in, you will see again those turbulators. And they are here to make sure that this boundary layer that you would hope would stay laminar or as smooth as possible up to here, you would transit it into a turbulent boundary layer so that the, um, the guiding device at the back of the tail here um, has as much effect as possible. So when the pilots change the angle of this, of this part here, the flow will follow um, the curve and not separate. So you want to maximize the possibility for the pilots to deflect the air at the back of the airplane. And for this, you transit the boundary layer from a laminar to a turbulent one. Uh, last example, um, perhaps something you can practice with every day because fluid dynamicists never stop practicing fluid dynamics, is frisbees. Now, uh, there are many kinds of frisbees you can throw around. Uh, this one is uh, the flying ring from ARB. Um, and it's a very long-range frisbee. It's been a bit uh, misshaped by storage in my apartment. Um, but this is a frisbee that you would throw and you would expect at least 100 meters range on this. Very, very long flying, very smooth flight, very silent. On that kind of frisbee, you are aiming for long range, you are aiming for low drag, and so you will have very, very thin surface, very smooth surface, and you try to promote a laminar boundary layer on top of this. So this is one thing, um, but if you're playing with friends, uh, you're not trying to play um, long distance. You're only trying to have fun and you want to throw the frisbee in all kinds of ways. You want the frisbee to be able to fly slow. Uh, you want to, the frisbee to be able to fly with high angles of attack, S fly down instead of falling. And for this, what you want is a, a very rough top surface. 
and a very dented note. So the worse, uh, the dense inside the frisbee you get, uh, the better it will fly because you promote transition of the boundary layer from a laminar case instantly to a turbulent boundary layer and the turbulent boundary layer is much less likely to separate. It will separate eventually, but it's much less likely to separate. So if you're trying to play tricks and throw throw this with the backhand or catch it um, behind your back, um, then definitely what you want on top of your object is a turbulent boundary layer. So with this, um, you should get the basic ideas about flow separation, how to prevent it, and how to promote it uh, in some other areas.